hands at all. I lost a lot of people. <laughs> I lost a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. No, then I will, I will try harder. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, welcome back. So this is the uh, last lecture. So. Uh, maybe it's time to try and get to the main point, I guess. So today I, I will try to explain to you that we can actually compute those uh, factorization homology, sorry, not the other way around, factorization homology in that particular case where the input is some balanced bread monoidal category. and. Uh, Maybe let me try to say, or maybe say again, some some kind of like motivation, and use this uh, maybe as an excuse to to make a little recap of what happened before. And I really hope that, I mean, thank you for bearing with me. I hope that when I will state the main theorem, you will understand why I spend so much time telling you about the structure on, on character varieties, because somehow. The whole idea is that all of those things actually have an analog for factorization homology, and so this is some sort of like guiding principle of, of the sort of thing you would expect to be true. So uh, let me say, like, why? Why would you do this? So I guess the first, uh, the first motivation uh, is that, well, thanks to Claudia's talk, I, I guess you know convinced that this is actually an interesting question on its own, basically. So this is like one of the first. like non-trivial example. I mean, there are others, of course, but. Um, so if you believe that you know factorization homology is something interesting, you, you might want to compute it. And this is like the first, one of the first examples where, where, where this something interesting happened and where you can actually do this. And not only it's one of the first non-trivial example, but in a way that was like one of the motivation for this whole idea of factorization homology. So all those, those structures, like this, this not invariant, you get this representation of bread group. Uh, if you're a physicist, you might like the idea that they are related to, I don't know, like conformal field theory. And as Claudia said, factorization homology used to be called chiral homology, topological chiral homology. And there are, this was supposed to be like an abstraction of the sort of things that happen in conformal field theory. So basically, this is like the sort of one of the motivational examples, I guess. So the second one is, I guess, from comes from low dimensional topology. So this, this sort of like scaling point of view that I described yesterday, it, it doesn't necessarily give you like a complete description of this category, but at least it makes it clear that from from that category one gets like representations of. Of the group of breads in in that surface, uh, because you know those are like in particular elements in this scan category, and you get invariants of uh, links in S cross I, and and because this definition of factorization homology is like completely like purely topological, completely canonical. You also get representation of mapping class groups. Okay. So basically, any, any diffeomorphism from S to itself gives you like an equivalence of category from factorization homology to itself. 
and then a path in the space of diffeomorphism gives you an isomorphism between those. But in fact, I, I claim that there is some extra structure which, which allows you to actually get an actual representation of the mapping class group from that. And uh, so I, as I mentioned, uh, so the third, the third motivation is really this particular example of Rob G. And I guess before saying anything else, I should say that this is pretty much the sort of, um, maybe not the only, but like the main example of a bread monoidal category that we actually know explicitly. Like the, the, there are other examples, but this is somehow a good balance between some something which is like highly non-trivial and interesting, but, but still computable. So of course that's the main category you want to try this to. And uh, so I know I've, I haven't been hyper rigorous about this whole like quantizing Poisson structure thing. So I should mention that there is a general business of like taking Poisson structure and trying to quantize them and that's perfectly fine and that's something that people like to do, like, like me. But in this particular instance, I thought I had something like slightly more uh, heuristic in mind, uh, in the sense that you really you have this idea that group, group G is actually symmetric monoidal. And the claim is that if you run, you, you get these character varieties on, on, you know, you might believe that those are like in, in interesting objects. So this is really about sort of deforming this into something which is actually breaded and not just symmetric monoidal. So the sense in which this is actually a quantization of an actual Poisson structure doesn't really matter in a way. That just like the, uh, this is replacing something commutative by something like less commutative and with, with more interesting structure. And somehow the corresponding picture for character variety is that you replace loops on S by links in S cross I. So there is a, there is a precise sense that, that probably would need a whole lecture for itself that I, in which the, this process of quantization somehow turns like homotopy invariant into isotopy invariant. So this, this, this breading is somehow what makes things like non-trivial and interesting and this Poisson structure is like, it, it's telling you that, that this thing might actually be there. So it, it's not that you care that much about the Poisson structure itself, although again, it's, it's something interesting, but it just, it's a clue that there is something like, like that happening here. Okay. Uh, right. So before actually stating some version of, of the main theorem, let me uh, make an important point that maybe I could have done a little bit before. I don't, I don't remember if Claudia mentioned that, but one of the important features of, of factorization homology as it's point, what, what do I mean by that? Is that if I take any surface or any object in this category, so this guy is symmetric monoidal, and in particular, when you have a monoidal structure, you have a unit, so something that plays the role of like one in a monoid or an algebra. And in that case, the unit is the empty manifold. Um, in, in this category, that, that might sound a little bit weird when I write it like if you've never seen that before, but the claim is that the, there is an, an embedding of the empty manifold into S and there is in fact a unique one. Like this is not just a unit, the monoidal structure, but that's actually like an initial object in this category. Or maybe I should say there is like a contractible space of, of, of maps like this. Yeah. But then because factorization homology is functorial, and symmetric monoidal, then the empty manifold is sent to the unit for this tensor product of category. And, and this unit is just the category of vector spaces. And so you get a functor from the category of vector spaces to factorization homology. And well, a linear functor out of vector space is just really determined by the image of C. So here you get you get an object in this category. And, and this is what I mean by, by pointing. You don't actually get categories, but you get pointed categories, like a pair of a category on an object. And it turns out that this is very important. For example, I, I might not explain why, but this is 
the fact that you get actual representation of mapping class group, not just like categorical representation, that, that's because it's pointing somehow make, makes things more rigid. And, uh, and as a first example on, of how like the sort of structure you get on factorization homology match the sort of thing you get on character variety, if A is rough G, and if you fix some base points, then actually this object is identified with function on the character variety as a module over itself, so as an object in This, this is an algebra, so this, uh, every algebra is a module over itself, just a left multiplication. And because the multiplication is G equivalent, so that, that, that's why this notation actually even makes sense, then this is actually a G equivalent module. So that guy is an object in here. And uh, I wrote this version by like choosing a base point, but if I don't read what I, if you know what that means, this thing is actually the structure sheet. So it has this like canonical algebraic geometric description as a structure shift, and then if you pick a base point, then you get an identification of quasi quantum shifts on character variety with that. And this I this identifies this on the okay. um, So that's something I've already mentioned, but maybe just write it again in case you're not very familiar with that. So there is this general notion of um, so A is bred monoidal, so in particular monoidal, so you can talk about algebra. Uh, I have trouble with plural today. Uh, you can talk about algebras in monoidal category. So this means that there is, it's sort of the obvious thing. So you have a map from A tensor A to A. So already I, 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 I said it, but I'm not sure I actually wrote it which is associative in the sense that, you know, like M tensor identity composed with M is M composed with identity tensor M. Um, and maybe some of you are wondering, wait, but there may be some associativity constraint, let's, you know, forget about it. Like, if, if you're wondering about that, then you don't need me to explain what, why, why you don't need that. And, and now you have a notion of algebra, and you can also talk about modules. So there's a notion of, you can talk about the category of A module in A, which are just like object in A, together with a certain action from A tensor V to V, which satisfies the ob obvious action. And I should say, of course, here is also a notion of unit, and on the unit would act trivially, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, anyway. So this is a notion that ma makes sense in general for monoidal categories. And of course, this is, uh, this is a particular example. Okay. Uh, okay, so I guess it's time for uh, some theorem. So this is our uh, main result with David Benzley and David Jordan. Uh, I will try to make a parallel with the character variety as I go. So first of all, let S be punctured. So assume that its boundary is not empty. And let's fix an interval on the boundary. I, I, I make this choice once and for all. And once I made this choice, there is a canonical uh, yeah, let me phrase this up. The canonical algebra structure on this object OS, this is pointing. Again, here when I say canonical, I mean once I've chosen this interval. It's not like kind of like in the absolute, you need this choice, but like no, no, no more than that. That's a fairly reasonable choice. And there is also a, a canonical equivalent from 
compile transition homology to category of modules for this algebra. Okay. So for now, really, this is like you might be disappointed. Like this is not yet a computation. It's it's, it's still like an abstract statement. It basically saying that this possibly complicated category is actually a category of modules, which is sort of as simple as it can get. And of course, the analog of that is that if you pick some base points, then this gives you an equivalence between the and P from the character variety and this algebra function. Okay. So again, here you, mat you might be complaining because I told you a lot, like, if you don't know what this means, take this as a definition. But uh, for people who know what that means, this is a theorem. So this is basically, this thing is basically saying that the, like the represent, it, it's just a reformulation of the fact that the representation variety is uh, fine. So this is not a hard theorem in that case, but, but that's a statement. And let me emphasize the fact that this is true for closed surface as well, but this won't work here. So there is this strange thing that somehow the, the representation variety is always a fine, but it's more a fine when the surface is concrete. Like for closed surface, it's, it's the fact that it's so fine actually do not survive quantization somehow. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, like, like, like this is not part of the theorem. This is what it corresponds to for character variety. Like this is supposed to be an. Um, yeah, the, the point that of quantization, it's not, I mean, it is a particular case of the theorem, but that's not, uh, if you just know that, that's not obvious how to prove that from that. I'm saying that in the particular case where A is rub G, this general theorem essentially reduces this one, which we know is true. And my, my point is that this, this is true for like geometric, Yeah, that, that's what I said here. Yeah. Yeah. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm not writing this as a corollary, but rather as a, so this is true for geometric reason. Um, I claim that in fact, this is secretly a feature of factorization homology. So this, this I'm, I'm sort of again emphasizing that this construction is like a particular case on a sort of guiding uh, example for factorization homology. Say again? Yeah, that, that, that's how you prove it, yeah. I'm not sure, I mean, this, this result is definitely new for any algebra, for any category which is not rub G. And in a way that's even sort of new for rub G, it's just uh, in the sense that you still have to prove that the, this pointing in factorization homology is really the structure shift. This, uh, what was your question? Uh, sorry, if what? Oh. Well, I mean, uh, I'm not sure the right hand side was known before. Like. Like part of the theorem is always an algebra in the first place. That that's actually not obvious. Yeah, a priori this pointing is really just an object. There, there is no reason a priori for it to be an algebra. Uh, and I mean, even if you knew, like for example, for quantum group, this algebra is something very familiar that people you know knew about. So maybe your question is like, did this particular case did people know that there was something like excision? And I don't think so, like people were really considering like as an algebra in vector space, I would consider the representation variety. And they weren't re really like thinking about this category. And again, really the motivation to think about this category rather than just this algebra is because we know that this thing actually behaves better on specific excision. So that was really the motivation for that. So in a way, you're right that for quantum group, like the, this category actually exists, but people were not, not actually considering it. 
and I think they, they, they knew that in this framework they didn't have like some nice green property and that, that probably wasn't obvious that this was the way to fix that somehow. I don't know. Okay, I'm still struggling to find the eraser. Okay. Let's go. Okay, so that's the first staging. Second statement is that no, if if s is closed and as usual s not is s minus a disk, then there exists again a canonical. I don't really don't want to say it too much too often. From the algebra associated with the annulus to the algebra associated with O S uh, not. Um, yeah, I, uh, and then there is an equivalence between this arm. Uh, allow me to be a little bit vague here, like some uh, a certain category of O S not module in A on which this algebra function on the analysis as uh, this algebra with the analysis acts trivially so green. So basically you, you can so this is a punctured surface, so this is factorization homology of, of S naught. And the the first claim tells you this is a category of module on the Second claim basically tells you that when you want to seal the hole, basically you respect to a certain category of, of modules on which this algebra acts trivially through this knot. This is not literally true, you need some extra structure, but you know, let's let's leave it at that. And then the corresponding statement is that so this algebra knot is an analog of the this uh, moment map. That I told you about, and again, that sort of also shows why you know, that like as a map of, of variety, that's not very interesting. But the fact that it's a moment map really tells you that sort of the Poisson structure again is a clue that there is something more going on. Like it's a, uh, it's quite literally a first step in the right direction. Uh, nobody would get that. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah, I guess you need that. And it, it should be S not here, so it's fine here. And then th this category, like the way you go from the category for S not to the category of S, this this should this is an analog of the fact that the character variety of S is mu inverse of I D and G. So I'm not sure I said the name of this this construction, the fact that this is Poisson is something called a uh, Hamiltonian reduction. So again, as a variety, that's fairly trivial that this work, but making this work with a, making it compatible with the Poisson structure is, is definitely not obvious. And this, uh, somehow this is a categorical counterpart of, of that construction. And then the third po point is, is the is sort of actual computation. So let S be punctured as well. So I assume that this is uh, the boundary is non empty. And again, that I still have like my interval in 
uh, boundary. Okay. And the, the statement is that every choice of a skeleton in that case is just one vertex which should be somewhere on I so I restrict to the case with one vertex just for like exposition purpose you, you actually have a version of a true several interval and you have like a more complicated skeleton but every choice of a skeleton gives uh, Let's say, a, I will give example later, but like a presentation from bad, bad generators on relation, or at least explicit. So let me put quote here. Oh. Oh, yeah. So this algebra is actually fairly abstract, but I, I claim that if you choose a skeleton, which basically is the same as choosing a way to get your surface by gluing several disks together, then you get some combinatorial presentation of this algebra. And of course, this is an analog of the fact that the representation variety of S, when you choose a skeleton, this gives you an identification with like G to the power three plus N or H one. Well, this is G is a genus on, on the unit. And again, the fact that this skeleton can be used to encode for features is actually work marginally as well. So basically, so this this is the part where I claim that this is an explicit computation of actualization homology. So maybe I should say a few words about that. Of course, it's only as explicit as the bright monoidal category. A. Like if you don't know that explicitly, you you can't do any explicit thing. But somehow it's like it's not less explicit; it's just as explicit. And somehow the nice thing is that it's kind of, it's fairly agnostic uh, about what you mean by explicit. Like knowing explicitly some bread monoidal category can mean different things to different people. So it might mean having a scaling presentation. It might mean uh, having a category of modules over some explicitly described algebra. Uh, it might mean it might mean something else entirely. Um, in in a way, this term applies like for whichever formalism you're you're more comfortable with. So every time you have an explicit bread monoidal category for whichever use of the word explicit, then you get an explicit description of factorization homology. Okay. Okay. Any have we any questions so far? I don't know much about the VOAs, to be honest. Like, yeah. if. Uh, yeah, I mean. I mean, I mean. Like, if you think, I, I don't know, like quantum groups as root of unity, or equivalently, like Greenfeld categories as a rational parameter, they're, they're supposed to encode this conformal field theory, so I suppose they are related to VOA. Um, and in that case, in that case, yes, I mean, you can actually do this computation. In, and I think they are, um, Jordan Gane from David Jordan, they have, have done some work on like quantum groups at, at the root of unity. But definitely, I don't think, I mean, not, not necessarily in relation with VOAs in particular, but, but I think that that would be example, I think. Yeah? Where, like here, for example, no, in OS here, like my my bread monoidal category A is just arbitrary. So this is just this is an object in my bread monoidal category. I mean, no, I mean if. If your bread monoidal category is rub G, 
then this is the structure sheaf of like the character stack, and it's actually O of R S as an object in that category, not C H S. So what is it that is so? This this come from the, I mean, for the case of quasi coherent sheaves, again, this is a structure sheaf. In general, this is this pointing I was talking about before. So the fact that the empty manifold has a unique embedding into S, so by functoriality, this gives you an object in factorization homology of S. Say again? Y yeah, I, mean I can write like that. This inclusion of the empty manifold into S, and that gives an app from factorization homology of A. S is Why? I mean, it, 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 it's not the structure sheaf on S, it's the structure sheaf on, on the representation variety of S. Yeah, yeah that's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. S, S is topological here, there is, no, there is no complex structure on S. So that so there is no ambiguity. Like the representation variety has a well defined structure of an algebraic variety. On I'm just saying there is ambiguity in the structure. Oh, why? Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, I mean. Yeah. Okay. Al allow allow me to keep using this notation. <laughs> That's. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure. I see. But like. Yeah. I mean, you you write this kind of. I like. I could call it AS 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 well, but I call it O precisely because I don't want to that. It's some sort of structure shift, but you're right, it's not a structure shift on S. So that's maybe maybe non standard, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It it obviously depends on A. Maybe. I don't I don't I don't remember. Yeah. So I'm, yeah. No, I guess I should probably at least try to give you a some sort of example. M maybe it's better than thinking about the proof. We'll see what time we have left after that. And again, I hope it will then somehow like make some of the stuff I told you about before make sense. So the. Of course, the, the first non-trivial example is what happened when S is the annulus. So you might say what happened for the disk. In the, for the disk, O S is actually one. That's the unit of this category, and it's a fun exercise to show that modules over one are ju just the whole category. So basically, this is the this is the first example, and uh, so this thing again has like a standard. It's not canonical, but there is standard choice for this, this skeleton. And the claim is that for that skeleton, the object you get as an object in your category, so this is, uh, yeah, this is going to be confusing. Uh, this will be a co n for all, oh crap, I forgot something important. Uh, <laughs> Say again? No, no, I will, I will, I will come back to that. Uh, I just, uh, there is a very important condition on A that I forgot to talk to you about uh, because I was planning to say something about it yesterday, but I, uh, anyway. So I, I need to assume that, oh yeah, sorry. Like this, for this theorem to be true, I need to assume that A is rigid. So usually rigid means that every object has a left and a right dual. And uh, yeah, actually I was, uh, I planned a little philosophical discussion about that. So 
in, in Claudia spoke, you, you saw that this notion of duality is important for this, this, this CFT. And here the fact that you know, factorization homology exists tells you that the object A, like the category A itself, as an object in some ambient category, is sort of sufficiently dualizable. And it's kind of strange that actually, in this paper, we actually need some condition that the object inside of A also are dualizable. And I don't have a good explanation for that. And I, I really wish I had. But then, so I, I must assume that A is rigid. So usually it means that every object has you know, a left and right dual. Think that if you think about the example of vector spaces, like in that case, vector space is really the category of all vector spaces. And obviously, they are not all dualizable. So in that large category world, there is a natural sort of analog, which is to say that every compact object has, I should say, a left and a right. So, so again, this again, this is kind of funny. Like, like for a single object having dual is a finite nice condition in the same way that you know in vector so finite dimensional vector space. But somehow, for A to be rigid is a finite nice condition on A, which I I don't really understand anyway. But I need to assume that. So, this is a this is an important assumption. And this is true for rub G and rub QG, uh, obviously. Uh, okay, so I can go back to yeah. 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 You can probably. I mean, first of all, I don't. My category is they are not generated by compact projective in general. I don't assume that. And even when they are, it it might be an to assume that. Compact projective are dualizable, but I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I think I sh that that should be for like if it's generated by, if it has an house projective, that I think it's an house to assume that those are dualizable, but I don't assume that in general. Sorry, yeah, the, 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 the question is also uh, a priori, yeah, no, I mean, I'm, oh, uh, man, uh, say again? Yeah, but that, that, that's that's not that because the, the, the distinguished object for the dis is the unit, and then this is the image of the unit. So I I wanted to take a shortcut, and I was like, that's funny. I was actually thinking about this mo this morning. I was like, well, that's easier to state it that way. And I was like, why don't we do that in the paper? And that's why. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's pictorial, but but what it shows is that. OS as an object in here is the image of the unit, but OS is not the unit of an object of A. It's functorial, but it like doesn't preserve the size of objects somehow. I, mean, I haven't given the answer yet. Uh, the, qu the question is, a, a priori OS is an object in this category, in factorization homology of A. So how do I see it as an object of A? And uh, yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> Obviously, uh, oh man. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, the disk doesn't know anything about that, so that just can't be that. Yeah, yeah.
No, I mean, it's, it's, it's okay, let me give you the answer. That's definitely related to that. I yeah. Okay. Absolutely, and that, that definitely plays a role, yeah. Yeah, that's true. So what, what? Of the unit. Of the unit of A. Like there is a functor from A to factorization homology of A, and it maps the unit to OS. Yeah. And 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 so the the answer that I I, I I try to hide. So thanks very much for asking this question because yeah that that didn't make sense. Uh, the, the the thing that there is uh, so indeed there is uh, if you choose an embedding of like I have chosen an interval uh, on the boundary, so I can pick an embedding which is like close to this interval, and this gives me a functor from A to this category. And indeed it's true that so it maps the unit of A to OS. And in fact, like hidden behind the theorem are two things. The first one is that this looks as a right adjoint. That's true for uh, because of one of the exercises that we were supposed to do today. Like this category a functor has a right adjoint if and only if you preserve co-limit. That it, it's the case here. So here there is a right adjoint. And what's somehow like part of the theorem tells you that this functor is actually sorry, yeah. Oh my god. Well, let's say this has a right adjoint. I think it's, a, it's really the danger of being used to identify too much things. That so this has a right adjoint, let, let's say Rs, and somehow I claim that part of the theorem uh, or rather the proof states that uh, or is that ah. uh, this adjoint is actually itself co-cosmos, so it preserves co-limit. And more importantly, it's space full. And this is this is actually how you prove the theorem. So remember, we had an exercise two days ago saying that if you have a category with a space full functor to vector space, which preserves co-limit, then this has to be modules for an algebra. So here we go. I, I didn't want to talk about the proof, but basically here it is. Like, like the whole point is to prove that this right adjoint satisfies this property. And so the what I call OS as an object in A really is like the, this. But but because this is a faceful functor, I tend to think of them as being just the same object. So uh, apologies for that. Yeah, it, it, it's not. I mean, it's not clear, but yeah, it's it's in the panel. Okay. So basically, like the the way I said things might might seem a bit circular, but somehow, like after the fact, when you know that this is a category of modules, obviously there is a forgetful functor where just forget the module structure, which map you know OS as a module over itself to the object OS. Sorry for that. 
I hope this is not too confusing. Let's go back to the example of the analyst. So in that case, I, I claim that the, this is algebra as the following definition. So as an object in A, this is, uh, let me just call it OA, because that's actually like the building block for the rest. So, And this is the co-n over all compact objects. of x dual tensor x. And in particular, in case A is semi-simple, and I hope this will be familiar, you actually have that OA is the direct sum over all simple dualizable, like simple and compact, say. Yeah, but I, I introduce a new notation and I call it OA. <laughs> just just because I can. Because I will, I will. No, the curly A is a category. Like it, it <laughs> so, sorry, I mean, the, the, uh, there is a reason for, like this is an algebra that a lot of people have considered and this is some like really canonical algebra attached to the category. It just happened to be part of the theorem that is isomorphic to the algebra for the analyst. But this is somehow like a more fundamental object. It's not just that. Okay. Well, then I say it that way. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and so if, if the category is semi-simple, I claim that you can actually write this as a direct sum of a, the, the simple object. And obviously, this should remind you of this Peter Weil the composition of O of G. So in a way that's, you know, that's a justification for introducing this new notation, like O of G is in particular the algebra function on the representation variety of the analyst, but that's also perhaps more importantly function on G, you know, so anyway. So this is really like the same, the same uh, very similar ID. Now what's the multiplication, so maybe you can guess. So the multiplication, so that's really the same idea. So I could do it just for the direct sum or, or for that. The main idea is that by definition, for every compact object x, there is a map from x dual tensor x to that by definition of a colimit. So I, I just need to define the multiplication on those. Um, well, how do I do that? Then, well, so this is in OA. This is in OA. And I want some peak which is in one copy of OA. And I claim that I want. Again, this should hopefully 
be familiar. So this X tensor Y dual, it's a general fact in monoidal category that this is canonically isomorphic to Y dual tensor X dual. Okay, so I want to go from here to here. Well, there is one sort of obvious way to do that. Just use the braiding. By, by the colimit property, this gives me a map from OA to also OA. To OA. And if you remember, so I hope you see it, like A is wrap G, then the braiding is actually symmetric, and it literally reduced one of the description of the multiplication O of J that I, I gave you. Okay, and the claim is that this map is, a, is an associative multiplication. And I should say that, uh, again, this algebra is, I, I definitely don't claim that we invented that. This algebra is very well known. At least when A is rub Q, uh, rub G or rub QG, or maybe uh, or maybe comodule over like like in the case where the category is actually a category of modules, like like people used to. I mean the the version as an algebra in vector spaces whenever that makes sense is well known. And then there, uh, Version is a category, so I, I should probably cite some names. So the the place where I learned about this is a paper by Dolin, sorry, Kulish, Rudolph, which is a BKM on this list. And uh, so they they do the version for you know Hopf algebra and in vector space, but this is very very explicit, and they sort of explain. Uh, I mean, I will explain that, but they observe that there is a relation with, you know, the, the annulus on, on stuff like that. Um, somehow this explains why. And then it also appears a lot in work of uh, Majid and many others. So it, it has many names, actually. Some people call it the braided dual because as an object, it's the dual of, like for rub QG, it's the dual of UQG as an object. Some people call it the reflection equation algebra, and I will tell you why. And uh, some people call it the canonical cone. And uh, yeah, it has it has many names and appears in many many places. For example, like if for rub QG, it's a theorem by a slightly different version again by Donin Mudroff. And uh, I should give them at least once, which is a weird principle of that. Alexeyev, Gross, uh, Schomerus. That. Uh, this algebra quantize give a precise sense. Uh, this same NFT and Chomsky structure on G, which is the same as the structure on the representation variety of the annulus. Okay. So somehow I want to uh, maybe not you know brag a little bit, but ma make a point about what's going on here. So basically. People knew about this Poisson structure and representation variety. There is this Poisson structure. And basically, this Alexei Gutschomerus structure, they have like a very general procedure, it is some sort of like conformation of Fock procedure, like where you replace the classical R matrix by quantum R matrix. So it sort of defined the algebra that way. And then they said, okay, we can check that this gives a quantization of this variety. 
Somehow the, the thing I like about this factor this phenomenology approach for, for that particular application is that you actually have something which is canonically defined. And then you, have a, you find a way to actually compute it and you get this algebra as an output. Like you don't, you don't start with the algebra and then prove it as the property you want. You start, some, you start with something which has all the property you want by design. And then there is a way to compute it which recovers this algebra that you pay you. So in a way we don't, we don't get like a new quantization or anything. Uh, we don't claim that, but somehow we get a nice sort of topological way of getting this. So for example, they don't really have like nice green formulas or that depend on many choices and stuff like that. And, uh, anyway. And uh, uh, so maybe I should just uh, keep with that example. So um, there is also this thing that every uh, object in A, that's sorry, every compact object is a comodule of a so A. So again, if A is some category of module over some of algebra, then OA is some sort of dual of that, so that's natural that you, you get comodule. And uh, the way it works is that if you start with uh, any object x, so let me get this right uh, here, here. You can just use a coevaluation because by definition this it's dualizable and take something like this. So this is coev. Uh, maybe I can just draw it like. So you have this co-evaluation because it's dualizable, and then you have, by the colimit property, this map into OA. So in particular, you can define a map x little x. Maybe I should call it v. Well, never mind. That's that's a deal with. Let's call it. Never mind. Oh, sorry. I, I, I'm used to say V for things that are actually vector spaces on, on anyway. So you can define a map by, if you start from O8 on the X, and you, uh, sorry, the other way around, X on the OA, and then you use this comodal structure, so you get something, a map here, and then the identity on the last slot, and then you can just multiply. Okay, this is an algebra, so you can just multiply. So this is some morphism in your category. I will switch the board. Um, I think a, a proposition again that should at least in slightly different form be attributed to DKM and maybe Majid is that this element satisfies something called the reflection equation. Which is something like, uh, beta, let me try to show it like x, x, beta, x, y, x, y, beta, y, x is. What does this equation mean? Well, that's, that's just a defining relation of the breadth group of the annulus. So the, for some reason, let me draw like the, the hole in the second annulus like this. And I claim that this x 
operator is really just like a, lo a loop around the puncture like this. And then I can do this and bread, and then go behind it again, and then bread again. And so if you look carefully, I can take this loop and just like shrink it and go through here and, and push it down. So this is actually equal to bread first, then go behind it, then bread again, then go behind it. And I claim that this is like the, if you want to give a presentation about the relation of the bread with the annulus, you have like a usual bread relation. And this is the only additional relation. So this is a defining relation for uh, the bread group of the annulus. Mm -hmm. And in fact, maybe let, let, let me just maybe say it. So what, what DKM actually proved is that in some precise sense, this algebra is universal for this property. So that's the largest algebra that extends the representation of the bread group you get from A to a representation of the bread group of the annulus. And somehow this factorization homology thing ex explain that. And again, if you, if you specialize to the case U, Q, G, L, N, and you take X and Y to be just the n-dimensional representation, this is actually, this gives you like all the relation for OQGLN, like for X equal Y equal V. This is a defining relation for, let me write it that way. So remember that I gave you another presentation of GLN precisely with operator like this, like X, V, X, W. And the relation wa was just that those guys commuted. Now they commute up to this, like there is this non-trivial braiding going on. But this is, again, I want to make a point that this is an analog of some something I, I told you about for O of GLN. So again, this has a, a sort of general n analog, not only for quantum groups, but for somehow like arbitrary braid monoidal categories. So all these things sort of generalize nicely to that to that setting. So I'm I'm almost out of time, so maybe let me just give the example of the puncture torus and then I should probably stop. Uh, okay. So now that there is a general idea that uh, you know I can I can again, like build any surface by, by gluing these pieces together. And, uh, or rather that the representation variety is just a bunch of copy of G. And I claim that for the puncture to say again? Oh yeah, sorry. For the puncture to there is an algebra D A, which as an object is just two copy of O A as it should, because the representation variety is two copies of G. And the multiplication is determined by the fact that each copy of OA That's the definition. Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> that's O of T2 minus a disk. Yeah, that's, that, that's what I meant by the, the case of uh, yeah, they, they have special name because, you know, they are special. <laughs> uh, so each copy of OA is a subalgebra. Okay, so I if I give you two elements in one copy of OA or the other copy of OA, you know how to multiply them. So the only thing I need to tell you is if I take an element in each, how do I make that like cross? And then I can, you know, multiply things together on each side. So there is some cross relation. Okay. So because it, each copy of OA is more or less some sort of like direct sum of uh, X dual tensor X, I actually have like two actions of the bread group, like one, one for each object. Like OA is made out of tensor products of two things. 
Okay, so in particular, I can apply a bread with full strand to that guy. So if you if you'd rather, like here, you have for example x dual tensor x tensor y dual uh, tensor y. So you have like four slots where you can apply a bread. And I claim that, okay, I have to remember it right. And this one goes over. Okay. Um, I think that's the correct one. Okay. okay. So I claim that this is this is a cross relation. So if I have, I want to multiply. Like if uh, if, if I have two uh, an, an el an element in O8 on so A and another element in O8 on so A, I use this braiding to change the order of the two middle elements and then I multiply on both sides. So I want I won't tell you why we yeah. It's, I mean the it's yeah. Here? Which one? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's all, it's, it's here. Yeah. Yeah, this is, this is, yeah. This is slightly, yeah, correct. <laughs> Corinna, look, yeah, you don't remember either. That, that, I think, I'm fairly sure that that, yeah, I should have, I should have done it before. I thought I could remember. Anyway, I mean, it doesn't really matter. The, the idea is that there is just like some bread diagrams that tells you how to multiply the thing. And, and again, in all the, you know, there are many cases where this braiding is actually very explicit. Like I gave you this formula for the quantum air matrix for GLN, so you can just plug this on, on you can actually write on like generators on relation for this algebra. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the general idea is that yeah, so basically every, uh, if you know the sort of like general pattern is that if you have a skeleton with one vertex, you have one copy of OA for every edge. And then you have like somehow many different configuration, the many different ways that these edges can sort of interact with, with, with each other. And for each of those, you have a diagram that tell you how the cross relation. But actually for the general case, there is something simpler. Like yeah. I don't see why this is a relation for the long tree. It's one side of the relation. No, it's not one side of the relation. So the the thing that uh, maybe let me write it that way. So uh, okay. So I I have two copies of my objects, and I want to define a multiplication. What I claim is that I, I take this and I, I apply it here. So I use this diagram to exchange those copy of OA. So let's, I don't tell it like one, two, three, four. So this is a, a, what, what's called a cross relation. So I get something like that. Uh, sorry, this guy is two. So I, like I want to multiply this on this, okay? So I know how to multiply this guy on this guy. I know how to multiply this guy on this guy. But the only problem is that they are not in front of each other. So I first want to switch those factors, and then I want to multiply here. Yeah. And the multiplication is given by the diagram I gave you before, but I, I don't want to draw it again. So this is what I mean by a cross relation, okay? I have like if you if you if you can see me, so you have two elements and you want to multiply those two with those two, you first find a way to like cross those and then you multiply this one on this one on this one on this one. So this is a cross solution. But then but then what I claim is that for example if you take wrap QGLN and you take this 
element X for the fundamental representation. And you take, uh, as I was doing before for GLN, like a matrix of generator, and you sort of write this equation that gives you an actual representation with like real gene generators on like real relation. Okay. And maybe let's just, if I can have like maybe two more minutes finish for the, the general case. So that that will have, I think, exhausted pretty much all the stuff I. It, it, it it's not quite as from a survey. It's from like a skeleton gives you an element of the drug group. Like, or rather, every for every pair of edge, on a skeleton, you have an element of the bread group depending on how they interact. There are at least three polysporosity. Basically, the it's you can have this, I think. You can have this. And then you can have this. Okay. S sorry. Okay. So I was just drawing the three the three different ways two edges on a skeleton can sort of interact. And so maybe just finish so now there is a, a general cool construction. See let A and B be uh, algebras. So there is a construction that sort of looks like this one, and maybe like, make you un understand this one better. So I claim that A can be an algebra. And how do we do that? Well, take A, sub, sub B, sub A, sub, sub B, and you, won't let you would like to multiply the two copy of A together and the two copy of B together. And well, the way you do that is by using the braiding. And then you know you multiply. So this is called the braided tensor product of algebras. Okay. So let me you know it that way with a little tilt to emphasize the fact that that's not just tensor product of object, but they have this algebra structure. And so the claim is that. So factorization homology over S, G, N, with N at least one. is actually equivalent to D, A, breaded tensor product G time, breaded tensor with O, A. So of course, compare with well, no, no, that's that's clear, I guess. That, so, so in exactly the same way that the the representation variety of some of S G N is just a bunch of copies of G, here you have a bunch of copies of O A, um, and basically you only have to know what happened for punctured torus and annulus. So like heterogeneous surfaces, you just like glue together punctured torus, and then if you want to add holes, you just glue annulus annul 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 um, let me emphasize that in fact you ask me that again to sort of connect things with this with stuff I was talking to you about in the Poisson world. In fact, I claim that this is a general fact that is breaded tensor product. It's actually a quantization. Uh, Fusion, this fusion of G Poisson spaces. Sorry, mod. Okay. So again, this is another sort of bit of this dictionary. So I told you that one, one tool to do this like combinatorial construction of this Poisson structure is this thing called like fusion of G Poisson space. 
And uh, the claim is that if you replace rub g by rub qg, then this bracket constant product is like a quantum analog or a quantization of the fusion procedure. So the, the character variety is obtained by like fusion of Ponkio torus of on analogs. So these quantization of those algebras are obtained by right on some product of of those algebras. Okay. Uh, okay, so I guess I'm out of time, so I won't say a word about the proof, but I already sort of told you the main idea anyway, so let me stop here. Sorry about the yeah, 15 minutes extra. So, uh, any question? Yeah. Okay. Great. <laughs> Great. Well. <laughs>